Okay, welcome to uh, Trader Tuesday. Today is uh, April 2nd, 2024. So welcome everyone. This is the third one we've done. It's been kind of fun. So I thought uh, I'd invite a few of my friends on. Wayne, uh, we've been working together for a long time and um, it's uh, always good to get to know uh, the backstory for people. So you know, Wayne, you've got a really interesting story. It all started back in college working on cars. <laughs> yeah, it's uh it was quite an interesting little journey how I ended up looping into trading. <laughs> yeah, do you want to kind of go through that a little bit? Oh, uh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, it, originally uh well, I guess originally, you know, I I went I did it. I think I think I did it like everyone else did, right? That was the idea was like, you know, I grew up in, you know, middle class America. Everyone was just like, you know, you got to go to college, right? That's the way to go, right? We were all fed this this um sure. You know, this is how life is supposed to go. So, you know, I go to college and I started, you know, I, I initially went to a four-year university, right? Um, university of North Texas. And when I went in after the first couple semesters, I started looking at the finances behind it. And I was like, man, this is getting really expensive because I was, I was paying my own way, but I was doing it through like a mixture of loans and working. And, uh, man, I was like, dude, this is, this is crazy. Uh, I mean, you know, by the time, by the time I, so my first semester in, it wasn't too bad. I think, you know, tuition was maybe, I think like $6,000 a semester or something like that. Uh, by the time I got out, uh, we were paying, oh, I think 18 or $19,000 a semester. Ouch. And yeah. And that's, you know, that's not including books, board, food, you know, a room and board, nothing like that. In your first, I think your first year you had to live on campus, right? That was a requirement. So you, of course you're paying for all the on-campus amenities and stuff. So it got crazy. And I mean, it was like, I was like, all right, you know, fine. You know, I'll, I'll work this way through. And so I was working anyways, I was a bartender at the time, went from bartending to being an automotive tech. And then when I was, uh, you know, as I was, you know, growing as an automotive tech, uh, I started working and eventually I took over the shop, uh, management of the shop that I was actually working at. And then eventually the owner and I, we ended up partnering up and then I took over ownership of the shop. And then, uh, yeah, from there I was just looking at, well, is this really what I wanted to do for the rest of my life? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know about this. Right. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. yeah um, uh, my dad and my stepmom are both business owners. And so I was like, well, you know, I need to start doing something different. I was like, I don't know if automotive shop, there's so much overhead and liability and growth in automotive shops. It's really challenging. Actually, it's a really challenging, uh, kind of, you know, a really challenging industry. Uh, turnovers high, things like that. So anyways, long story short, I was like, well, I need to put my money somewhere. So, you know, I grab some money. And uh, I threw it and I started looking, you know, putting it in the stock market somewhere. And that's kind of where it all started. And I was like, uh, where do I put it? Right. And at the at the time, I was like, well, there's a couple IPOs that were coming out. And I was like, well, well I guess I'll stick it in IPO. And I learned my lesson on that one. <laughs> so um, and I was like, well, OK, wait a second here. I need to do some more research. And so uh, I Let's started looking about into this. It. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I uh, looked into ETFs, uh, looked into those types of things, right? This is, this is kind of where it all started. And eventually uh, I reached out to uh, someone that I knew was a trader and an investor for a long time. You know, he had basically been trading for a better part of you know, 30 years. So I go, Hey, um, you know, teach me what you do. And I was, I was blessed to have that because he started teaching me. Right. And we started uh, we started going down um, algorithmic trading in ETFs, right? So uh, some simple algorithms in the beginning, and then we started doing some more complex algorithms. And then, of course, I started doing the uh, uh, short volatility trading, and then volatility led me into, well, if you're going to trade volatility, right, what's the main main portion of uh, an asset out there that's based on volatility and it's options. So that led me into options. <laughs> so, yeah. And then from, from that, I started, you know, I started, I think like every retail trader, right. I started to, I started to, you know, research, um, you know, who's out there doing this, what kind of, 
what kind of traditional, you know, or what types of trading are there? So I started out in calendars and I went from calendars to eventually I ran into butterflies with John Locke. And that was way back. I don't know. I think that was, I shouldn't say way back, but it was back in what, 2013, maybe 20, 2012, yeah, 2013. That's about right. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so I started kind of taking uh, his strategies, which are, they were, they were awesome, right? You know, back in the day with the Russell and everything, they, they, they worked well, you know, hindsight 2020, I, I know where there's some major flaws in them, but at least at the time they were really great strategies and they were kind of groundbreaking, right? The whole kind of concept of uh, certain types of adjustments and the fluidity of market of uh, options was really awesome. And let's see from there, uh, inevitably, I took some of his trades, kind of blended them and like, you know, started creating like a Frankenstein out of them, right? Like something that was kind mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, all crazy. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so I went, I ended up going to one of his, uh, one of his trader uh, expos or whatever you want to call them. And we were down in Hawaii having a good time. Uh, drinking Mai Tais on the beach. And uh, eventually at some point in time, someone was asking me, you know, what I did. And I just kind of explained the Frankenstein that I made. And uh, what do you know, it ended up uh, linking me up with the president of a hedge fund. And then they wanted to see what I was doing. So I was like, well, sure, I guess I'll show you. And so they were like, oh, wow. And then they were like, hey, you, you want to join us? And I was like, sure and then there we go <laughs> went from went from automotive tech to professional hedge fund trader in a matter of a few years so that was pretty crazy so when you were at the hedge fund i know uh you were designing uh etf portfolios for high net worth folks yeah so so what ended up happening so i originally was designing like esoteric strategy or like you know option strategies on broad-based indices and then what I was doing was I was, I found a, I, I have a formula and this formula, it, it, it's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a mathematical way to blend strategies that have absolutely no, like no linkage to them at all. Right. You know, even if, uh, I mean, if there is a linkage, the formula will find it. But anyways, it's it's a it's a long formula. But anyways, the point is, is I was using that in blending, you know, option strategies and our option strategies, and inevitably, uh, that led me to well, hey, can I take this same formula that I created and blend it into say like an ETF a portfolio? That's something for like a long only investor because I did I had a lot of clients or friends of clients that reached out to me outside of the fund and were like, Hey, I, I need something for the rest of my portfolio. They were like, you know, you guys only have, you know, X amount, um, and you guys are only options. And so I was really, you know, they were like, Hey, can you do something with a long only like an IRA that's just sitting over here? Right. I've got a few million dollars that's just sitting there, or I have a few million dollars and I have it with a registered investment advisor and they're, you know, they're not, they're not doing anything or they're not doing enough or they're just long only and crazy. Right. You know, something like that. And, uh, so I said, okay, yeah, sure. Let me see what I can do. And so I grabbed it, I turned it over and then I said, here, you know, let's rock this for a little while. Uh, let's, let's see how it goes. You know, let's not do anything crazy. Like, please don't grab your 10 million and just throw it in this. Like, let's go look at this and let's see how it works. And so we did, uh, we rocked it for a little while and it, looked like everything was doing fantastic, right? The, um, the training that we did the algorithm on versus the live results were very, very linked or they, uh, very synced up. So we were like, okay, it looks like it's pretty solid. So of course that client started to put more in and then that client reached out to other people. And then it was just kind of created a snowball effect. And, um, I didn't want to, at the time, um, it's starting to change, but at the time I didn't want to manage anyone else's money, uh, especially because I was already at the fund at the time. I didn't want to, you know, compete, right. I didn't want to run into that, uh, non-compete clause and NDAs. And I just didn't want that kind of a headache. 
so um inevitably i was like well what do we do and so um it, it, and then eventually what ended up happening was is the the hedge fund that i worked at wanted to um, go a different route um, they wanted to change the strategies that they were doing and that didn't line up with what i wanted to do for you know my clients and also what i wanted to do for myself and so i uh I branched off and, you know, we started with you and me. And then I took this sleep well portfolio that I was using with my clients and, you know, converted it to something that now public, you know, the public can use and the retail trader can use. Uh, it's a good story and a good journey. Um, what, what kind of, uh, things would you recommend to people if they're just starting out uh, what kinds of things should they look for or avoid or you know, what kind of advice would you give somebody if like your neighbor came and say hey what do i do i got some money what what should i do with it yeah um you know i i might start a different route than most people might answer this question but like i think the first thing that you've got to figure out is you know what's your what's your time frame um, and I don't mean like what's your investment time frame. I don't mean like what's your window. I'd say like, how do you want to trade every day? Like, how do you want to, how do you want to invest? Like, do you, are you, are you investing or trading for time freedom or are you doing it to replace a job? If you're doing it to replace a job, then, you know, day trading and things that are faster and significantly more active trading, like let that rip because that's, you know, that's going to replace a job, right? If you like to be that active and you're going to be doing something all day and you're going to be in front of a desk and, you know, you're going to be stuck to market hours. And I think that that's the way to go. And then you can go down and then day trading opens up all sorts of doors, right? You can go through futures, you can go through, um, you know, currencies, you can do options, day trading, zero DTE, all sorts of stuff. There's so many, so many roads to go down. Um, if you want something that's going to give you a little bit more time freedom, which is the way that I prefer to go, I start to do where I at least check the market once a day and I do my trades. I kind of align things. Um, sometimes I'll check it a little bit more often, but I can still take vacation and line up, you know, once a day where I can sit there and say, hey, let me sit down, have lunch with the laptop, change my trades or, you know, adjust my trades or move on. Or if I don't want to for a week, I can just take a week off. It's no big deal, right? It's it's nothing. It's, it's just, you kind of treat it like a business. So that's the way I like to do things. And then if you really want to be a little bit more laissez-faire, then something with a longer horizon, right? Something that you're not checking once a day, but maybe you're checking once a week. So like the sleep well portfolio or uh, some other kind of, you know, portfolio that's leveraged or something like that, which I mean, the leverage portfolio, by golly, that thing has been a beast this year. I know I've had a lot of people reach out to me because there's a, there's a way to do the sleep well portfolio, which is leveraging under high water. Um, so basically when the sleep well portfolio draws down, you leverage up. And if it draws down more, you leverage up even more. So it's kind of like a, a martingale approach, but there's only three X leverage. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, man, that thing's that thing went to the moon because we were drawn down enough to get to three X leverage. And then, you know, we've kicked into new highs, as you know. So we're at, you know, something like 40, 40 something percent return, but uh, with no leverage. So it's been fun. So, yeah, um, I would say time horizon, hands down time horizon. And then after that, um, I would say, you know, uh, I'd. I would say, how much complexity do you like? You know, if you like something that has, are you a chess player or a checkers player, right? If you're a checkers player, uh, then go with something like futures or swing trading or, um, you know, trend trading or something like that or RSI trading or that way you're, you know, mean reversion trading. Yes, yeah, something uh, fractal mean reversion. Oh my God, that's a glorious way to trade. Uh, fractal mean reversion. That's the way to go right there. But um, if you're, if that's the way, you know, very 2D, two dimensional, it's simple. It's up, down, right? You don't have to do uh, too many moving parts. If you like to play chess and, you know, especially like four dimensional or five dimension chess, right? <laughs> then, 
you know, probably jump into the options world because, uh, boy, the uh, the math and the complexity is, you know, limitless. And then there's this, there are, since there's this time element in options, and then there is the, you know, the expiration spread in options. It's just, it's absolutely beautiful because not only do you deal with direction, but then you deal with the decay of time and then you deal with the decay of time across spread strikes and then you deal with how those influence each other versus the capital risk versus the gamma risk of each option across spreads and across time horizons it's just it's so beautiful like i really do love all of the complexities of options and just how many how many unique ways that you can really attack and and use options to your advantage i I kind of alluded to the difference between, uh, you know, regular directional trading is like a computer, right? You know, you got ones and zeros, right? And, you know, it's powerful, it's strong, you can make a very powerful computer. And then options, it's like quantum computing. You don't, you're not just up and down. There's no just zero and one there. You can be in a state of flux at all times. And it's really beautiful. No, I know uh, you uh, you have lots of different strategies you're doing. So, um, how do you diversify what you're doing? You know, you've got some short term, some long term ETFs options. Uh, how do you pick what goes where? Yeah. Um, so there's there's kind of some tried and true rules of diversification, right? And um, like I said, I have a I have an equation that I could, that I use for my own portfolio. Um, I've, I've, I've had a lot of people ask for it and I don't know, I'm still on the fence about that, but anyways, I'll, I'll get off that subject. And the point is, is I think the tried and true principles of diversification is number one, you know, what's your just historical correlation. And I think that that's what everyone kind of knows about, right? So make sure you have uncorrelated assets. Um, but what I feel like everyone well, here, I'll get to that in just a second, but uncorrelated, right? Uh, you know, just to kind of simplify things for maybe any of you guys listeners that aren't um, uh, aren't as, you know, experienced with what correlation is or things like that, or you're still learning, right? The uh, correlation is just like, if I were to, if my friend were next to me and we were to say jump at the same time, we jumped together. And we jumped exactly identical to each other. That's a correlation of one, right? We are exactly synced up. Um, but let's say that like I'm on the beat of a melody on a song and he's on the rhythm beat and he's jumping with the rhythm beat and I'm jumping with the melody, right? I'm jumping a lot more often than he is, but still the melody occasionally syncs up with the beat, right? The rhythm beat. And so there's occasion times, there's certain occasions that will jump together. So there's a light correlation there, right? And then, of course, uncorrelation, or I should say inverse correlation, would be something where I'm jumping at the, the rhythm beat, and he's jumping opposite of the rhythm beat. So we're literally in complete opposition the entire time. So that's that correlation. So you definitely want to look for assets or trades or... Um, anything that's uncorrelated. And so a lot of people stop right there though, and they just look at the directional correlation or maybe the return uncorrelation. And I would say there's two elements there that you really need to focus on. And this is what I, I very much learned in the hedge fund. Number one is make sure you have edge diversification. So edge diversification is something that a lot of people don't really think about, especially when they're adding another strategy. Normally, it's like, especially retail traders, right? We're always like, oh, yeah, hey, that's a new exciting trade or a new exciting strategy, right? Uh, but when you dig deeper into the strategy and you link them up over each other, you realize that, oh, yeah, that's a, you know, a butterfly behind the market. And that's a butterfly behind the market. They're just hedged in two different ways. Oh, great. Well, they're fundamentally still stepping on, you know, the base structure is still a butterfly behind the market, right? 
Um, or let's say you've got a butterfly behind the market in one strategy and you've got a butterfly ahead of the market in another strategy, then, okay, they're still using a butterfly, but they're on two different sides of the market. So that's, they're somewhat fundamentally uncorrelated, but at the same time, they're both still negative Vega trades, right? Um, but they're all at least directionally um, different. So you, now you're starting to get a little bit of uncorrelation on a fundamental basis, right? Uh, but then maybe you've got one that's a calendar-based trade, maybe one's a, a, a butterfly-based trade or a condor-based trade. And so that's when you start to get some magic, right? When you start to get some very fundamentally uncorrelated um, strategies. And then I would say the last thing is uh, time diversification, right? So, you know, I have strategies that are zero DTE or, you know, one DTE or something like that. And then I have strategies that are, say, in the 14 range. And then I have strategies that are out there at 30 or 60 sometimes or one that's fluid and it goes all around, right? Like my adapt advance. The you know, the point is, is that you want to make sure that you're not all sitting on the same time frame, especially in options. Like, like I said, it's, it's, it's chess, right? So if you have an expiration that ends up getting blown up because of a, maybe like event risk, because event risk right now is a really big deal. So as an event comes approaching in the options are baked in just specifically in that that expiration or near that expiration, but they're falling off in front of that expiration. And then behind that expiration, they stay a little bit elevated and then eventually it tapers off into the normal contango curve. So like something like that, like you, you want to make sure that you're, you know, spread apart in different areas. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I've, uh, I've been told from, you know, other members, you know, members of one of my services that, a lot of people are actually just looking for something profitable. <laughs> so of course, get to that point first, right? Get get to your first profitable strategy where you could at least be profitable with one. Um, but then I, you know, then eventually what you're going to do is you're gonna instead of trying to make that strategy bigger and fatter and beefier, grab another one that complements it, and then you start spreading your your risk across both of them. And I think in the beginning, you can just risk parity them, right? So you can sit there and you say, okay, this one, you know, risks roughly, you know, 20% per trade or something like that, or 20% per day. You normally want to put it in the same time frame that the other trades in. So let's say you've got a daily trade and then let's say you've got a monthly trade, right? Okay. Well, the monthly trade fluctuates, let's say 3% per day and the daily trade, you want to make sure you size the daily trade enough to where let's say they're, they're sinking up at about 3% per day or something like that. Right. That'd be a nice risk parity. You blend them both together and voila, right. And you have a good time. And then now you've got a complementing strategy as long as you can run them both. So that's what I do. Um, that's what I always enjoy doing is, um, and then also you can run more strategies when they're executed at different times in the day, or if they're executed at different time frames, right? Like once a week, something like that. So you can diversify your portfolio and manage it really easily. Now, I know you've talked about Ray Dalio in the past. Uh, how has he influenced what you do? Huge, huge, actually. Um, initially when I was making sleep well, uh, that's where I was looking at, you know, because at the time, you know, I had, uh, the client was like, hey, you know, I need something to do. And I was like, well, like throw in something like an all weather. And then um, he was like, well, can you look at the all weather and, and, you know, give me your your take on it? And at the time, you know, I wasn't really uh, too into just long only portfolios and things like that, just because I had options and that was enough return for me. So I really wasn't looking for anything else. And so then I was like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll take, I'll take a look. So that's what I did. I, I go and, you know, looked at it and I said, yeah, because, okay, I see what he's doing. Okay. And so I kind of um, engineered or back engineered his, uh, the, the algorithm he's using to design or to, you know, risk parity uh, each one of his assets. And I, I realized that he was just using a historical, you know, historical precedence on, you know, what assets he was using. And I was like, okay. And I think the problem that I had with that is I said, well, the issue that you're going to have with this is that you, the assumption is, is that history is going to be the same uh, is the, is the future, right? Or the future is going to be the same as history. Right. And I said, that's fine and dandy and everything like that, but can we, can we overlay a, 
uh, can we overlay like a, a mutating formula that will basically self check itself and readapt itself to the to the the current you know i guess i guess the current macro regime i guess is what i would probably describe right and you know that's that's really when the sleep bell was born is 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 by doing that right so that's why we weren't in bonds in 2022 that's why we were we hit new highs in the middle of 2022 and then that's why we're at new highs now because you know it's just you you got to follow with where the macros are right i'm not you know even though economically there's definitely a, there was definitely a recession and there's recessionary tides and we have a recessionary tide like coming up this quarter, but it's not really going to be a recession. It's just probably going to be a correction, but um, you know, we have all those types of things, but you know, the system is beautiful in its own right. It, you know, it looks back at itself and I check it and make sure it's not doing anything stupid. Um, so it does really great. And you can hear Ray Dalio when he talks about his machine, you, he talks about um, he talks about, you you don't override the machine unless you have very very good reason right you know he talks about this in some of his books and um also the macroeconomic elements that are in the sleep well uh, are also built upon the credit expansion cycle and contraction cycle that he introduced and uh yeah so i mean the whole thing i mean he was just he was monumental and everything so give credit where credit's due i mean he's a brilliant guy and uh, it's it's just amazing what I've learned from him and, uh, you know, Paul Tudor, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, you know, all sorts of, you know, every trader that I've ran into as far as just like a retail guy when I was just researching people. And then also all the traders that I learned from and uh, being actually in the industry, which was really awesome as well. Now, you've uh, really taken the reins on the uh, economic analysis, kind of deep dive with the business cycles and all that. Um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about um, how people should think about that for their trading or investing? Uh, yeah, it's um, it's huge. It really is huge. So like, um, and, and, and I want to just start out like macroeconomics and especially just economics in general, it, there's a science behind it, but there's not a perfection behind it. And I, I think that I'm really excited about AI and what AI can eventually bring because the the challenge with macroeconomics is that you've got so many moving pieces that it's really kind of amazing how much things can uh, change and it can catch you kind of off guard. So like, for instance, this last cycle, uh, I, you know, I, I knew economically we were having a contraction, things like that. And I was waiting for the monetary expansion to start. And I was, I was pretty confident that the monetary expansion was going to start in late 2023, but I didn't see it happening, right? Like none of my data was saying that it was happening. And then all of a sudden my data started to shift, right? So of course, sleep well started going long, right? And it's picking up all this stuff. But as a human, I'm like, wait, why, why are we showing, why are we showing monetary expansion? There's no monetary expansion going on right now because, you know, at the time I believe the fed. <laughs> um, so at the time I sat there and I go, Oh, well, you know, they're still tightening their balance sheet, right? They're still selling balance uh, on their balance sheet. They're still selling assets. Uh, they're still raising interest rates or, or, you know, everything. So I'm like, why is there why are my why are my models picking up that there's economic expansion or not economics uh, but monetary expansion and um and it's only monetary expansion in the financial system not in the not in the consumer or economic uh area right so i was sitting there looking at that and i go man what is going on and uh it wasn't until uh, really a couple months in that I realized what was going on. And I, and I talked about this quite a few times in my videos and I still talk about this today, but yeah, basically the fed overprinted back in uh, the COVID era or post COVID era. And they overprinted shoved a bunch of money into the reverse repo market to basically create or provide the liquidity and stability in the treasury markets for when they did raise rates to make it to where there wasn't a, uh, a spike on yields and we go into some sort of bond meltdown. 
and the federal government ended up using those funds in financing their spending bills. So that's why they were spending like crazy. And that provided an economic stimulus into very select sectors that those bills um, provided, you know, silicon and electric and car and energy. But um, yeah, so, you know, we're looping this all back around and basically simplifying the question that you asked, which is the the monetary expansion. We live in a monetary expansion and contraction financial world now it is no longer the markets are no longer driven by economic forces um or at least if they are it's significantly less than what it used to be and it's because the fed and i shouldn't even say just the fed but central banks around the world now actively intervene in you know, quote unquote, free markets, right? So they're, they are literally buying or selling securities on the open market, which influences hugely, right? They're, they're the biggest buyer, the biggest seller in the world, right? You know, they trump everyone. For instance, they put, you know, $2.4 trillion in the reverse repo market that's a big buyer of treasuries, right? 2.4 trillion, that's the econ economic size of Russia, right? Of a whole country. It just in a piggy bank in the United States. It's crazy. So anyways, so those forces are huge. And if you're unaware of those forces, so like maybe you're a short seller, right? And that's what you like to do, right? You're a short seller of, of stocks. And you're and you are aware that there is a massive economic expansion or not economic uh, monetary expansion, such as what's going on right now. It is you're going to have a hard time short selling stocks. You're going to have a hard time finding stocks to short sell, and even when you do, the risk to get blown out is going to be higher, right? So you want to be in the favor of the of the machine of the of the monetary machine, and don't listen to what the fed is saying look at the money right look at where is the cash flow where is the money right and you know you can look at their balance sheet but now they found out this really cool trick with the reverse repo market right that's really cool uh, then they're trying to get more banks to start using the discount window so start looking at how much the businesses are using or the banks are starting to use the discount window because likely the next phase of monetary manipulation is going to go directly through the banks. Um, so I haven't really talked much about this, but the Fed right now has been using its balance sheet to grow the, uh, grow the financial uh, money supply. And they, I mean, they might eventually change a different tact, which is something that they did during the COVID era, which was they completely removed the restriction of reserve requirements on banks during the COVID era. Um, Tom, did you ever hear about that? No. Uh, yeah. So, so banks, like, so we, we live in a fracture, we like the, the financial system we work in is in the uh, fractional reserve banking system. So if you deposit $100, the bank gets all $100 and it goes, okay, great. We're going to put $10 aside and we're going to loan out that $90, right? Well, then that $90 goes into someone else's hand, say someone, you know, another business, right? And that business then deposits that $90 into the bank. And then that next bank goes, okay, we're going to keep $9 of this and we're going to loan out the rest of it, right? So, you know, the 81 and so, and it just keeps going and going and going, but in, inevitably at some point in time, you do get a limit of that point, right? You get a limit because you still have to have a 10% reserve requirement. And if you're forced to have that 10% reserve requirement, the money can't infinitely grow, right? So it does have to stop at some point. Well, what they did in the COVID era for a little while is they suspended the reserve requirements on banks. So basically the lending from one bank could be 100%. So you deposit $100 in the bank, 
they take that hundred dollars and completely lend it back out. You the, the money is gone instantly as soon as it hits the bank. It's just there's no reserve requirements whatsoever. It can be loaned out forever. And a lot of the time, what's going to end up happening is is uh, those, uh, or I think what's going to happen in the future is those that money is going to be used to buy treasuries, right? So instead of loaning it to other banks or loaning it out into the economy, because there's not a reserve requirement, they can infinitely buy treasuries to fund the government. So it's an infinite loop of money creation, which is, of course, an infinite uh, inflationary pressure financially. And so we, you do have to separate the fact that the financial system is very different than the uh, than the which we call it the the like the consumer prices right and the economy because the more money that's financing the government especially if the government is just spending it on interest right and they're not actually pumping it out into the economy then it's just financial inflation right it's really not going to be doing much of anything it's just going to make it to where that deflation doesn't really kick in and so yeah things like that you know you just want to pay attention to those kinds of elements right and it can be monumental in your trading so like for instance over the last few months like you really don't want to be a heavy short you know you don't want to be like a mean reversion to the downside type of trader especially in the spx right you want to be something more neutral of course being bullish delta and spx is very challenging but um especially right now in this current environment but like you you don't want to be also bearish right when things like this are going on because it's just never going to work for you right so yeah i mean it's very it's really really important to know where the macro pressures are oh and i like to keep these around half an hour and that's about where we are so um any parting words before uh before we wrap it up you know absolutely have a good time you know have a good time learning and trading and you know keep it small in the beginning of course uh you know i i've hit many 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 brick walls on my way to finding successful trades and of course you know i offer those publicly but you know you're you're gonna find something that you like yourself or a, a different trade or something like that and you know just start out with a little bit uh, watch out for anyone that doesn't give you their returns watch out for anyone that gives you phony returns right and how do you know if they're phony returns like just uh, you can you can look at them and you can just sit there and you say hey you know what's the trade size of them right you know what's your allocation to these types of things those are the types of things that uh, real traders you know, deal with is, okay, you know, I'm going to change my bet size between one trade to another trade, things like that. So, you know, just watch out for some of those little pitfalls. There's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of craziness in the retail education world. So use your better judgment, have fun learning them, start out small, uh, and then, you know, figure out what kind of trader you are as far as your time frame, and then emotionally figure out what kind of trader you are, right? After you kind of get in there like do you like the swings up and down do you like something more consistent do you like to quote unquote income trade and i would say with income trading um the best way to do income trading that i have found i'm not saying that it's the only way but the best way that i've found out to do income trading where you can be consistent month to month is trading multiple strategies on different time frames that are fundamentally uncorrelated and just pairing them all together and having a great time and be a great trader so you know, let it rock and hopefully you guys make a bunch of money. And uh, we didn't mention that uh, you have a website too. Maybe you want to talk about that for a second. Oh, sure. Um, Actually, I think you have it up on your screen share right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We so... didn't really talk about it though. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, well, like it's a uh, environmental trading edge. This is environmental trading edge.com or e trading edge.com. It'll take you the same place if that's easier to remember, but uh, yeah, so it's an SPX options systems. There's three of them out there. I'm actually here soon with you, Tom. I'm going to release a strategy with for the Abe indicator, actually. So um, I try to give everyone a little bit of a different flavor. So that way, like I said, depending on what kind of trader you are. So the adapt advanced is for those that, you know, like to be more fluid and like to know kind of like, okay, what's my 
what's my building blocks for our, my trade system? And then they can kind of build it every month and, you know, kind of do it from there. So it teaches the building blocks. And uh, I actually just recently made it to where the behind the scenes. So all of my educational videos are 100% free. So you can just sign up for options behind the scenes and learn how to do any of these strategies, of course. Um, but of course, to get you know live metrics and stuff like that, you will end up having to join. You know, it, it is a business. But and then of course, I've got zero DTE stuff that is you know sim relatively simple to execute. And then I've got the adapt dailies, which is one of those where you check uh, once a day. So yeah, the Abe indicator though that I'm gonna. Uh, do with you, Tom, I'm really excited about, I'm buttoning it up. So, and that's meant to be uh, really to take a trader. It's going to be the first time I've done this, but it's going to take a trader from not knowing anything, literally like I'm fresh to markets to learning options, to knowing what they are, to eventually at the very end, here's a trade system that now you know how to execute because I'm going to show you how to execute and write and teach you some tips and tricks along the way. And then here you go. Here's a trade system that you can go and run with, right? And there's there's your first building block for your trading career, right? And uh, if you want to add more systems in later, you can, right? Because you should know the the building blocks at this point. So that's uh, I'm really excited about that. Well, thanks very much, Wayne. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I really value our friendship and. Um, our uh, our youngest son is actually thinking of moving to Washington State or Austin, and he said if, even if they go to Austin, they'll probably still end up in Washington State. So I imagine between Brennan and his wife and then our um, number two son and Eugene will be making more trips to the Pacific Northwest. So it'd be great to catch up and uh, see in person again. All right. Look forward to seeing you, man. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Wayne. And uh, we'll... Uh, See you later, and uh, don't don't feel bad about uh, asking Wayne questions. He's an expert and hangs out at Trading Group One, especially on Fed days. So, uh, <laughs> if you want to catch Wayne, just uh, hop on Trading Group One, and uh, a lot of times Wayne will be there. So, thanks, thanks everyone, thanks Wayne, and we will uh, see you later. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Bye.